Many scholars would agree that modern philosophy really begins with Nietzsche at the end of the 19th century. His greatest contribution to philosophy is without a doubt the concept of the eternal return, and to understand it is to understand what modern philosophy is about. The eternal return was the name of an ancient Greek concept which essentially described the cosmos, the universe, as something akin to the mechanism of a watch, such that every X number of years, the stars of the celestial heavens would go back to their original position and everything that had happened would happen again in a new cycle, perfectly identical to the previous one. But Nietzsche's concept of the eternal return is very different. In fact, it's the opposite. Nietzsche does not think that each cycle is exactly identical to the previous one. On the contrary, there is something new to each new cycle. Unfortunately, Nietzsche died quite young and was unable to finish his work. It took another 60 years following his passing and another genius of philosophy to complete this great task. In 1963, Gilles Deleuze publishes his second book titled Nietzsche and Philosophy. The book quickly brought him to fame and for a good reason. In it, he completes what Nietzsche had begun and gave the concept of the eternal return its fullness and consistency. So what is the eternal return? First, it is important to understand that the eternal return is about ontology as well as gnosiology. It's about what there is in the real world, including objects and people, and it's about our relation to them, and it's about what we can know about them. The real originality of the eternal return is to focus not on eternal essences, but on forces. This is why Nietzsche's philosophy is often described as a philosophy of power. It's all about forces, as opposed to essences and identities. What Nietzsche argues is that things in the world, objects and people, are not essences that are recognized or potentials that are actualized, but they are certain types of forces that are affirmed. In the eternal return, there are three types of forces. Each succeeding to the previous one. In the first stage, all forces in a domain are active and they clash with each other. The strongest force subdues the inferior one and turns it into a passive force, which is of the second type. But then there comes a time where all the active forces in a given field have become passive or reactive. Once that happens, they begin to turn against each other and a third type of force appears, what Nietzsche calls nihilism. In our everyday experience, we hardly perceive active forces, and that is because we ourselves are the result of those. Our conscience, as well as our bodies, are of the second type. They are reactive forces, the product of clashes between active forces that remain invisible to us. The third type, nihilism, is found primarily in social events and institutions when they become totalitarian. But it's also found in psychological determinations like the ego when it becomes completely self-centered. This is where Nietzsche's explanation ends and he does not really explain what happens after nihilism. Here Deleuze's contribution is key because Deleuze explains that at the stage of nihilism forces have become so destructive that they destroy themselves and as they do so a new cycle of the eternal return begins. But the active forces that compose this new cycle are completely different from those of the previous cycle because after nihilism, Dolos explains, the ultimate act of the eternal return is to select difference or change or novelty from the nihilistic forces and from there to produce new fields of active forces. These new fields will be the basis for the new cycle of the eternal return. You could say therefore that every time change happens in the real world, every time you have a new thought, or every time a social movement ends, or even every time an atom changes state, a cycle of the eternal return is ending and a new one is beginning. And the novelty of the new one is determined precisely by the selection of difference that is operated in the last stage of the eternal return. If you are familiar with Deleuze's philosophy, you know the significance of the concept of difference. It is important to understand that the eternal return does not reproduce sameness. What it selects is difference, and by this Deleuze means an intensity, a power to produce new active forces that will inaugurate the new cycle, which will have therefore nothing in common with the previous one. In other words, two things never change in exactly the same way, or two changes are never the same. This is the great originality and achievement of modern philosophy and its distinctive trait. The fact that it puts difference, not identity or essences, at the center of the picture. This is how the concept of intensity or power is opposed to the ancient concept of essence by Nietzsche and Deleuze. This is the means by which modern philosophy attempts to conquer the difficult problem of change. 
change. What a thing is, first and foremost, modern philosophy tells us, is not an essence or an actualized potential, as Aristotle would say, but it's a power to affect and to be affected, because such is the nature of forces. Every time a force affects some other force, or is affected by it, it changes. This is why throughout its course of existence, a thing, or a force, never stops changing. The question now would be, if everything changes permanently, if everything is a force or a power or an intensity, then how can I have a sense of identity, or how can a thing indeed appear to be what it is? Deleuze's answer is found in the concept of repetition, which we will discuss on another occasion. So in summary, what Nietzsche inaugurated, which Deleuze brought to its term, is in fact an answer to the most serious question in the whole of philosophy. What is change? And Nietzsche's original answer is what modern philosophy is all about.